Hi guys, it's Narissa Sue, and I am your host uh, for the Lioness Method podcast. And today we are here with uh, Robbie Bent. And Robbie is a thought leader in the mental health space who is building a global community to improve mental health in an accessible way. And, and Inward combines beautiful social spaces built around saunas, ice baths, and the largest library of breathwork content in the world. I'm so excited about that, by the way. Uh, Robbie and the Inward team host a clubhouse show on psychedelic medicines and have been profiled by leading wellness brands like Eight Sleep and the Natural State podcast. So welcome, Robbie. We are so excited to have you today. Thanks. I'm in a great mood. Happy to be here. Awesome. Now, I've been um, digging into uh, your content. Thank you um, for actually, I signed up for a subscription for Robbie's um, content library, and I love your content. Um, I, I did a few of the meditations, and it's, um, I can't get over how much fun it is. Like, I, I enjoy the music, the whole vibe of it, and beautiful scenery and the videos that you have. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you guys to, to check out some of the content. Um, but I have so many questions for you today. <laughs> so we're going to start from the beginning before we dig into content. And I would just love for you to, uh, to share a little bit about who you serve and, and how you serve them. Cause there, I know there's so many different ways that you're serving the community right now. Yeah. So there's a number of different products we're building, but all with the idea to help people get into their bodies to really get over stress and overwhelm, but in a way that's healthy, fun, community driven, right? And so if you find yourself now like, hey, my mind is it's just all the time it's going, right? Like I'm thinking about financial strain, I'm thinking about my kids, I'm thinking about achieving something in school. I'm thinking about getting a better job. I'm thinking about like COVID and mortality. Like we're just programmed. We're so overstimulated. Uh, and it's because we're not in our bodies enough, not in the present moment. And there, like, there's a study that came out recently on loneliness and 73% of Gen Z reports being lonely. And I think it's a result of overuse of stimulation and, and mobile phones. And so trying to create practices that in a fun way help people uh, get into their bodies. I love that. And then the whole fun, uh, the fun part of it too, like I was, I was watching the promo video for uh, your center there and it, you, I, I don't know how you manage to make breath work look sexy, but it looks, uh, <laughs> it looks really fun. Like I want to go to your center. It looks amazing. Um, but yeah, I heard that same study and um, I heard some other numbers that I felt were really staggering too, as far as opiate use and just, um, you know, people are at an all time high of overdosing and accidental and otherwise, um, just because of the high depression rate right now. So, you know, there's loneliness, depression, anxiety. So I, I love that you're bringing this conversation you know, um, out into the world because there's so many people that need this right now. Um, and uh, so what are, uh, what are this, I know that you breath, you mentioned breath work, but what are some other uh, holistic things that you offer at your center? Like I, I saw that you guys all also have like an infrared sauna and maybe some, some ice baths. Can you tell us about that? Totally. And it started as you know, we can get into my background, but I struggled with addiction. So for people listening, you know, I had a drug and alcohol addiction for 10 or so years and then used primarily meditation and psychedelic medicines uh, to overcome that issue. And so now I'm trying to build something that's very accessible. And I saw meditation and, and psychedelic medicines um, be very difficult for, for many people. So of my, you know, 200 friends and acquaintances after four years trying to teach people meditation. Um, not many were able to pick up the habit. And some of these people are like super disciplined. They're very healthy. Mm -hmm. They get great sleep. They eat well. And I think when you get into the realm of, of mental health, it becomes, you know, challenging to really understand how you feel. So if I asked you now, like, how do you feel like this moment? Or how did you feel today? A lot of people won't be able to assess like what emotions Mm -hmm. came up and so there's a lot of like overwhelm 
not being able to focus on, you know, understanding how, how you feel um, mm -hmm. and, and like also not wanting to be vulnerable uh, and admit like, hey, there's something wrong. So by the time things are so bad, you want to see a therapist, often that's too late. What about like preventative measures that can like help you feel good in the now, right? So things that create mm -hmm. community, friendships, sharing, being seen, physical feelings of, of health. And so at the center, we're trying to really create a way that's like fun and cool, very much like the breathwork you mentioned, um, that's just accessible to everyone. And they're coming because like, oh, wow, I want to go to this place that feels like I'm at a Soho house or a cool restaurant. And then mm -hmm. I want to get in the ice bath and the sauna. And, and we've combined uh, education and classes with these elements. So in our new space, imagine a 40 person sauna, crazy sound system, like Whoa. bass <laughs> shaking, essential oils <laughs> over a giant stove. And there's a facilitator mm -hmm. who's teaching you saying like, hey, let's turn out the lights and, and have a fear release exercise. And people are sharing their fears and feeling their, their fears sweat away. Or, you know, wow, maybe that's gratitude. powerful. Right. And, and so it's, yeah. it's just kind of using theatrics, uh, senses, beautiful mm -hmm. aesthetic and environment to make mental health like fun and cool versus what it was for me, which is like, you know, I have an addiction. I'm going to see a therapist. I'm going to a room that makes me feel like there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's what we're trying to, to build is like removing the stigma, making these things fun. And a nice mm -hmm. comparison I like to give is, you know, 20 years ago, people who exercised was primarily athletes, bodybuilders at a, at a gym. Like, you know, if you're from Canada, a good life. If you're from U.S., like a gold gym mm -hmm. or 24 hour fitness. And then Soul Cycle came along and Barry's came along. And there was this boutique fitness explosion and now, you know, CrossFit. And it doesn't have to be high end or anything, but it's like community mm -hmm. music, like these really uh, entertaining experiences. And I think mm -hmm. there's a really good opportunity to do the same for mental health, mental fitness. I love that mental fitness. Uh, that, I love that term because that's really what it is, right? Is this being um, being well all the way around and looking at emotion as just a function of being human, not something that we need to turn off, but rather explore and develop and expand into. So I, I love that a lot. Um, and uh, Oh, there was a question that came up and it totally escaped you right now, but I will think of it. Um, but it sounds like a beautiful experience. I think that um, that's one of the things that um, I've seen is that there's this community lacking, right? And I, I absolutely love what you're doing because you're building a community around these uh, wellness practices. Uh, because we ultimately were craving connection. Like you said, you know, uh, loneliness is at an all time high. So coming to places where we can connect in, uh, in a healthy way, right? And do practices that support our emotional wellness, our expansion, right? Because um, how have you found as an entrepreneur that the more you developed yourself, the, the greater your success has been or, or what's that been like for you? Yeah, a hundred percent. But a lot of it was, was luck. I think it's not so much the success as an entrepreneur. It's how do you feel about yourself? Mm -hmm. And do you give yourself the power to do what you really want? And, and for example, you know, my first business um, was a venture backed tech company. Uh, I raised $25 million. And at that point in time, making money was the most important thing in my life. I wanted to feel successful. I wanted to feel loved. I wanted my parents to be proud of me. I wanted my friends to respect me. I wanted girls to like mm -hmm. me. And that company ended up failing after four years of like trying to make it happen. And, you know, my, my parents had invested, friends had invested. I put in a bunch of money and then kind mm -hmm. of lost, lost it all and felt like a complete failure. But I think one of the you know biggest things was just trying to do things to be successful and not thinking about what is it that I actually care about? What type of problem would I be passionate solving? Mm -hmm. uh, and even after that experience and a lot of self-work with you know, Vipassana meditation retreats and psychedelic medicines, I then joined uh, the Ethereum Foundation early on and I uh, was sort of lucky, to be honest, and was at the right place at the right time. And that project uh, has exploded and it's now the second largest cryptocurrency and the world's leading smart contract platform. And that was amazing. And all of a sudden I'm starting to feel good about myself and confident. And on the side, I started, you know, just with an ice bath in my backyard and every night 
myself and my fiance and three of our friends would have three people or five people, you know, seven people over for a campfire and ice bath. We weren't mm -hmm. even charging or, you know, it wasn't a business. It was just like, Hey, this is so cool. And mm -hmm. this is helping people meditate. And for the first time I would see my friends like no care about spirituality. You know, mm -hmm. let's say an example, standard, like lawyer works like 20 hours a day, just, you know, really concerned about being successful and, and overwhelmed. And then I'd see this person get into the ice bath and in like two minutes, like their everything would stop, right? The emotions, mm -hmm. to do list, stress would just fade away and they'd be completely present. And we just thought that was cool. And so we were just like, let's just keep inviting people. And so we'd go to like, you know, the coffee shop around the corner and the pasta shop around the corner and, and just be like talking about what we're doing. Like, hey, come over tonight. We're doing this like awesome barbecue. Obviously, this is before COVID times, just to yeah. clarify. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we like, did I'm that. I'm not doing that right now. Please don't come to my house. <laughs> and we did that for an entire summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, even like, I would just let people come in my backyard and use the ice bath. And so it was just mm -hmm. something I was personally really interested in. And I think if, you know, it had been before all this self-work, it would have been, wow, this, you know, how can this become successful? Like I'm playing a sound bowl with like a little hat on in my <laughs> backyard and like, this is silly. And yeah. I was just like, no, like, I don't care. Like I, it doesn't need to be a business. I'm just, I mm -hmm. love this, you know? And then mm -hmm. that little ice bath turned into a garage space with an ice bath and a sauna and a small website and just like allowing friends to come. And then that garage space turned into classes and then those classes turned into breath work. And then the breath work turned into like an online breath work platform. And then that turned into, we just signed a lease for a new space, which will have this like 40 person sauna and four ice baths. And like, Oh my gosh, congratulations. Energy. Yeah. And so it's just, but it's all come from like working with my friends, really caring mm -hmm. about the customer. Like this is stuff I do every day day that I'm like, that saved my life. And I'm like, just like, I love it. And so it's, you know, yeah, I think that having doing self work will give you the confidence to lean into what you really care about. I love that. And, and what, uh, what a, a true testimony to, to your work, because you describe what happens to a lot of entrepreneurs when they're trying to create a business through sheer force, right? Just by sheer will. Um, and maybe with uh, not clear intentions, right? Because I heard uh, you were describing that you might have been looking for validation uh, to some degree in the first business. And um, so what are what are some other things that you had to overcome during that self-development journey that you're describing in order for your business to be solid and successful now, since we're talking about personal development? Yeah, so the first, I would say was just poor habits related to this, like lack of self love. Um, that was a strong one. One of my like core beliefs, let's call it my core subconscious beliefs from being young and that mm -hmm. manifests itself in the need to like prove yourself and find love from others because you, you don't give it to yourself. And so that manifested in, you know, pretty severe alcohol and, and drug problem for a number of years. And so, um, that was something that through Vipassana meditation at first, um, opened my eyes to just the awareness of like, Hey, why are you so critical to yourself? Why are you having these thoughts? And I think before that it was, it wasn't even, I wasn't aware that I was like the way I was talking to myself. And then, you know, through psychedelic medicines that, that helped even more, I was kind of brought through, and I know you're really experienced in this field. It's like, these traumas come up of, of being young and, and being bullied. And I remember the first time, you know, I've told the story a bunch, but I remember the first time when I was in grade eight, like somebody offering me a cigarette and all the older kids were smoking. And I was like, oh, this is like your chance to be cool, to have these people, <laughs> you know, so I smoked a cigarette and thought, oh, this is rebellious. This is cool. And that pattern mm -hmm. lasted with me from, you know, 14 until I was around 28 years old. And so getting over that, particular pattern of, of not having enough self-love and then as a result like really vying for people's affection like caring about what kind of clothes I had and like that was so important to me for a long period of time and the self-work helped me not care about that stuff like so there would be you starting your business as an entrepreneur is super hard because the chances of failure are so likely mm -hmm. and the first thing you put out is naturally going to suck, right? Like, it's very, <laughs> like it, it is. It's okay, your no, first it's product, totally true. 
right? Yeah. So that's something else. So that's another lesson I learned, which I'll, I'll talk about more, which is would be helpful for those entrepreneurs out there. But like getting over that first set of like, you know, just in your mind, if you say, okay, this is just going to be a side project, I'm going to do it. Like you have to start, you have to get started. Mm -hmm. And so I never would have done that before because I would have been afraid, like, what are these people going to think of me in this product? Oh, they're not going to like my product, <laughs> which means they're not going to like me. And so mm -hmm. that was something that after I just became way more comfortable with myself, like I didn't care. So we'll, we'll test stuff all the time. And like, maybe it doesn't work. We'll do an integration circle for free for, you know, our, our team. We'll run like a sound bath for the community and see if anyone comes. We'll try and do like a charity fundraiser. And like, I don't know, 75% of the time the stuff doesn't work. The first product's not good. Like I just started mm -hmm. a clubhouse show seven weeks ago about psychedelic medicines where I'm interviewing people from the space. Which was amazing. And that, that does not suck. I've been yeah. sitting in. Yeah. Really? Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know that. So that's amazing. So, so that's yeah. the, you know, we're just, I, I just knew a lot of entrepreneurs in the space from some of the work I've been doing at Inward. And so just was mm -hmm. like, Hey, it'd be cool to give these people a platform and talk about building their businesses. And I was like, Oh man, I'm getting on. There's like 200 people. I don't really know what questions I'm going to ask. Like, what mm -hmm. if this sucks? What if the guest isn't good? I have no control you know, and I just was like, you know what, just do it. And I feel mm -hmm. every time I'm about to host the session, I feel like nervousness. And you would never know <laughs> that from hearing me because I'm a pretty outgoing person. And I mm -hmm. and I just like, I feel like I don't want to do this. What are people going to think? And you have to just like steamroll that fear. And it's like resilience training. You know, if you're afraid of something like you, you slowly put yourself in these situations and learn to conquer your fear. And so that was one is like when you feel that people are going to judge you and you're nervous of what they're going to think like a, a great exercise is to to practice so mm -hmm. you know maybe it's just reaching out to a stranger to ask for advice that's a great one because it can be done so you know you want to learn about sales look up a best sales course on google reach out mm -hmm. to the, the author of the course and just say like hey i have some questions for you and see if you can get someone to talk to you to, to practice and so i used to be mm -hmm. super um also nervous about reaching out to people and that was a huge lesson I had to learn as an entrepreneur now. So, you know, we built a physical space, like, how are we going to do that? So I reached out to the best, my two favorite retail brands in Toronto. One is Impact Kitchen, an amazing food, uh, like high quality grab and go restaurant. And the other is Superette, which is like a mm -hmm. super artsy uh, cannabis dispensary. And so I just, you know, read them like, okay, well, it's going to be really hard to figure out how to build this on my own, let's just reach out to these people and see like, Hey, who'd you use for an architect? And what do you have to figure out for permitting? And how did you do interior design? And so my MO now, and this is like, if you take anything away from this conversation, when you're trying to learn something quickly, the best thing to do is find an expert or someone you respect in that space and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation where you learn if you're even asking the right questions and there's no mm -hmm. faster way then finding three people you respect for a topic, interviewing them in three hours of time, what you can learn mm -hmm. is like immense. And then you're also building your, your network, uh, right? So every call you have, this is someone who can be a potential helper for you and your vision. So it's, it's just, mm -hmm. yeah, as an entrepreneur, I think that's a lesson is just to reach out to as many people that good people surround yourselves with them and ask for help. I love that. The ask for help is a huge one because I think um, I, as an integrated breakthrough coach, the the people that I work with, that's they're really resistant to asking for help. But one of the things that I've learned is that the more successful the person, the larger the team they have, you know, so they need more help. And so it, and it's not usually just within their business acumen, right? We have to, I think, as entrepreneurs, open up our line of sight and say, Okay, I am. I'm easy. I am uh, good at delegating in certain areas, but in my personal life, while we're talking about our self development, our wellness, and and networking, relationship building is what it comes down to. That um, asking for help is really, it's it's just about sharing the love. Um, ultimately, right? Because we're building relationships and not only asking how they can help us, but um, you know, always asking how we can be of service to others. Um, which uh, in Clubhouse, I think that's uh, that's actually where you and I met. So that's awesome. And um, and I have really enjoyed your rooms in, in Clubhouse. And um, Clubhouse is such a cool app. Like I think it's, it's changed the way that we are interacting with each other and um, with coronavirus and just this whole pandemic stuff and, pe and people feeling disconnected. I think uh, Clubhouse has just come in right on time because we're having conversations with people 
I mean, I would never even imagine. I mean, I was talking to Dead Mouse the other day about breath work, and um, like, how random is that, right? And That's then, so cool. like and then, so this, cool. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hi, I used to go to your shows, but um, and then like Elon Musk, you know, has been uh, chatting in there, and Dr. Stephen Greer. Um, so there's uh, there's a room for everything, right? You're talking about uh, having conversations about psychedelics. You can literally have conversations about entrepreneurship, aliens. I mean, it's uh, the possibilities are endless in there. Um, but I just think it's it's really cool. But I'm, um, I love that you're also bringing up the point about um, just kind of jumping in and doing it right, and not having uh, needing things to be perfect and not being afraid uh, that the first thing that you do might not be the best because it, it's all about uh, learning. Right. Is that kind of what you're what you found in your experience? Yeah. And I can tell two examples of, of personal examples of, of like how I started and, and how it's going. And so the first company was this global telecommunications platform. And so it had a SIM card that when you traveled could provision different identities. So if you're a American citizen on AT&T and you go to Canada, we could send you a Rogers identity and you wouldn't have to pay roaming fees. And so you know, we built the SIM card, we built the software on it, we built the billing mm -hmm. platform, we wanted it to work in every single phone, we wanted it to work in every single country. And we spent like an enormous amount of money doing that before really testing like, hey, do people want to use this thing? Like, <laughs> we spent so much money to build this. And then it turns out that maybe we should have just built a SIM card for the iPhone 4 for Toronto customers going to the UK and had one carrier deal and least everything else. And so mm -hmm. it's this idea of a minimum viable product, right? It's the idea of putting something out and watching customers use it to find out what they really want. And some opposites of that are, okay, let's build a nice bath and put it in a backyard and see what happens. And then it's like, instead of building a physical space, let's convert a garage and see if people come and what they do. Then it's, mm -hmm. you know, okay, finally now you know, we're ready for physical space. We have a membership, we have a community, people are paying. We know they love this. We know specifically what they want. And we initially had the idea to build a 12,000 square foot, like massive complex with like many saunas and a restaurant and treatment rooms. And then mm -hmm. what we found when people came was that they were way more obsessed with the classes and connecting in the hot and cold. And so it's mm -hmm. like, why bother with the restaurant and the massage? Like it's not a spa. It's this new type of mental health class to hang out with people. And we never would have figured that out if we didn't test. Another mm -hmm. example, is the breath work was just, you know, something we were doing in our space. And uh, we started doing it on Zoom for free for our community during COVID. And then mm -hmm. every week it started growing like 30 people, 50 people, 100 people, 200 people. And then people saying like, oh, could you put them on YouTube? And, you know, could you record one for sleep? And so we put out a little course, um, not super well filmed, just kind of did it all ourselves. And then people paid mm -hmm. for the course. And then they were like, oh, we actually want a monthly subscription. So, oh, okay, that's cool. And so we started recording all kinds of breath work in internally, writing the scripts, testing what people like. And then we found this strange thing. We were doing so much breath work. We started doing it socially. So on like a Friday night or Saturday night, people would come over and instead of, you know, I, I don't drink, but instead of wine and, and dinner, we'd be like, oh, let's do a mm -hmm. breath work. And so we'd all socialize <laughs> together. And mm -hmm. then what happened was we would freestyle the breath work with music we liked. And so instead of traditional, you think of breath work, you think of like, you know, waterfalls and wind chimes mm -hmm. and sound yeah. are cool. But we thought like, well, why don't we do this in a way that's more like upbeat and socialized? And so we put on, you know, a set, a favorite set from Burning Man, where it's just. Mm -hmm. like, boom, boom, boom. Yes, like, I love Whoa. the music. <laughs> I love right? the music. So it's yeah. like, it's, mm -hmm. it just kind of came from like, we never had the idea of, hey, we can make it more uh, fun and upbeat. It just sort of mm -hmm. came from, from testing and putting stuff out. And that's what people seem to love. So yeah, to entrepreneurs out there, put something out, watch what people do. And usually big problems aren't obvious. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is if there's a huge problem people have, like somebody's going to solve it because it's very obvious. And so usually there's like a problem you start to solve and then realize, oh, there's this non-obvious other problem that people actually want. And so mm -hmm. one example here was we thought the ice bath was for health right and longevity because that's what you see is like mostly people like peter atia and Rhonda patrick talking about that and then when mm -hmm. we started using it all the time we're like oh this is actually a meditative 
thing. And you, you hadn't really seen too many people talk about that. And then mm -hmm. when people came together, it was like, well, it's not even actually a meditative thing. It's like a social thing. And that was never the intention, but that's sort of what it became was like these crazy social experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think the more you test, the more you, you find um, other uses for your products. No, I love that. And, and, and also that you're just so in touch with your, with your customer, which are ultimately your friends, right? Cause you're building that community. Um, and I, I have so many questions cause you just talk about so many different great things. Um, but in specifically, you said that you just started out your uh, class as a free class and you organically grew it uh, from there. What were some of the ways that you were able to, for somebody who's just starting out, like what, what, what are some of the ways that you're able to organically grow, um, you know, your classes and then moving it from there? Just or get the word out, I guess. About yeah, a ton of brute force. And like, luckily <laughs> we have six people and like everything mm -hmm. that people told us to do, like it didn't really work. So like mm -hmm. when you're starting out digital ads, especially with something that's a class are, are very challenging because the cost of acquiring a customer is pretty expensive. And so, mm -hmm. you know, at first we just went door to door inviting people for ice baths and we would try to find people who had a big following. So CrossFit gyms, healthy restaurants, uh, trainers, physiotherapists, meditation studios, yoga studios, just like friends of ours that we knew who were cool, like artists mm -hmm. and creatives that had a big following. And we'd be like, yo, come tonight for this free thing. And as I mentioned, we did that you know, every day for, for a summer. So it was like a lot of time invested. Mm -hmm. Luckily there's six of us working on it. So it wasn't, and like, it was fun. It was something we, we really wanted to do. And that having, you know, people would come and be like, well, this experience is amazing. I want to tell more people. I want to bring more friends. And so just through word of mouth and like grinding, we grew to about a thousand plus people on our, on our email list and, and community. And mm -hmm. so when we started our breath work, we had a thousand people that, you know, I'd personally met, I'd personally done a sauna with, I was kind of friends right. with. And Good. so we sent out the breath work. It was like, Hey, you know, I'm stuck at home. It's locked down. I'm scared. I, I don't know what to do. I'm having, you know, I remember when COVID started, it was like mm -hmm. crazy yes. for people. Mm -hmm. Like Now you're kind of seeing the end. It's like the vaccine's here. It's like, okay. You know, people aren't talking about it as much, but it was it was like gnarly in Canada. It's winter time. It's dark. People are like, it was pretty wild. And so we were just thought, oh, we should just do this as a nice thing. And mm -hmm. you know, we put out the email to everyone, and I would just like again brute force, not like an email newsletter, like legit text message, WhatsApp, personal email to each person in our thousand person community. Like, hey. You know, it's a bummer we're closed, uh, but if you're struggling, we're doing this cool thing and we're like, we're doing it for free and we're doing it to help because like right now sucks. And mm -hmm. I think people just vibe with that authentic message. So if you're starting up, you don't have to just grow immediately. Like I think find something that's really awesome that you're building that people like, and then mm -hmm. focus on those first hundred and then thousand relationships so that was that was the easier part like it was a lot of work but it was like we know all these people we met them face to face and it got the ball rolling and through that we figured out okay what do they actually like what kind of categories would they pay for a membership do they want a course and then there was sort of like the next stage of growth which has been quite a bit harder i think there's also a huge gap when you go from like hey i'm a yoga instructor with a network of 100 customers like getting to that a thousand it's tough because it's it's like okay like this is everyone i i knew mm -hmm. now i have to find new people that trust me without knowing who i am mm -hmm. and so to do that we focus mostly on uh podcasts affiliates uh and those those particular channels and have just stayed away from from digital ads so a lot of word of mouth so a mm -hmm. couple of interesting things we do like every time someone's used the product 10 times we'll reach out to them and be like hey you know, here's a free three month membership that you can gift to somebody. Would you give us some advice about the product? And so mm -hmm. every single person who's used the product more than 10 times we've, we've actually talked to, and again, a lot of work, but I think talking to your users at first is like absolutely essential to build this, this like core community. And then every time we talk to them, we're asking like, Hey, could you refer to like two or three people? Who do you think would be a good fit for this? Why? And then like, Oh, well, here's a, here's a free, you know, uh, one month or three month trial for that person. And so each person you talk to hopefully leads to like three new customers and you're getting specific mm -hmm. 
aims at the stage. And then you're also finding out who actually wants this, like who is my core demographic that uses it. Mm -hmm. So mostly just at the stage, we're still pretty small. We've only been out for about four months, I think, but mostly at the stage of just like blocking and tackling, talking to individuals, like however we can getting people to use the product. Awesome. No, there, there's so many gems in there. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, and you have been mentioning the hot and cold therapies uh, as well. So I'd, I'd love for you to just uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, what that is for those um, people who are listening who, are, who have never heard of the hot and cold therapy. Definitely. And so it's just, in my opinion, a fun, like at its core, it's a, it's one of the best things you can do for longevity. And I'll, I'll get into that, but at its core, it's just a better way to socialize than traditional things we rely on when we feel nervous, like alcohol on our, our phones. Mm -hmm. So it acts as a social lubricant to just like make you feel amazing and connected. So most people are afraid of the cold and it creates this adrenal response. So when you come out, even in Canada, you know, what? Yeah, <laughs> is like even worse because you're like, oh, I hate really? the winter. I wear a jacket. Yeah. You know, it's like people are like, oh, I hate the winter. It's dark out. Like, why mm -hmm. would you, you know, uh, like 98% of people come in. They're like, I could never do this. I have resistance. I dislike the cold. So they do this experience and it's scary, right? And, and, and you do it as a team. And when you come out, there's this adrenal response. You feel alive, like absolutely alive. And so as a result, you're like, well, what am I going to do? I don't have my phone. I'm going to sit in the sun. I'm going to chat. And so it creates these like really deep social connections because your guard is down. You've just done this crazy brave experience and you feel really excited and and vulnerable and so it just mm -hmm. creates amazing social experiences so that's the most powerful thing of the hot and cold is like the community the social aspect and this was around it's ancient right so you know in, in mexico and latin america countries they would use the temescal as a way to uh, have a spiritual experience in like ancient rome they would use the bathhouses for like discourse and then to share knowledge mm -hmm. uh, in Finland, Russia, it's been used since like Estonia, it was used to connect with nature. So there's just so many versions of this going back thousands of, of years, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's a primal for sure. way for us to connect. And so when you get into the cold, specifically, your brain produces this neurotransmitter called norepinephrine, which is like, think about it as your brain turning on mood, attention, vigilance, you're becoming present. And what that means, you're in a physiological meditative state, right? So if you've struggled mm -hmm. to, to get clear, this is a way to find immediate focus, like emotions, thoughts, worries, all that stuff fades away. Mm -hmm. And what you learn to do through your breathing is turn your body from a fight or flight state. So think of like the gas pedal on your mind believing it's in danger, which is anytime you're feeling anger or anxiety, this fight or flight state is happening. And through your breath, long, slow exhales, triggering the parasympathetic system, the rest and digest, you learn to put the brake on. So you're training your body to turn on and then turn off stress via breath. And by practicing that every day, you can start to learn to take control of your, your nervous system. So this is sort of the mental benefits and there's just a whole ton of, of physical benefits. So this neuropinephrine, I had mentioned is extremely anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. so right now due to diet, environmental toxins, our bodies are constantly inflamed it's due to stress. You know, inflammation is a cause of like 70% of chronic illness. And so anything that can reduce inflammation across the body is categorically positive. It's why you see athletes, professional athletes using ice baths. Uh, mm -hmm after uh, exercise it's to heal and tony robbins oh. tony robbins <laughs> yeah it's, it's huge right like people yeah everybody that lives to 100 has low inflammation scores and strong mm -hmm. immune systems and so as we mentioned the ice bath lowers inflammation and it also increases the amount of white blood cells there's mm -hmm. a of awesome studies on winter swimmers having like uh, massive increases in their white blood cells during the winter mm. So from, uh, you know, longevity, immunity, so many benefits. standpoint, it's fantastic. And it's only two minutes, right? So you can even do this in a, in a cold shower. And so it's just triggering that neuroepinephrine response. Uh, just, just fantastic for longevity. Now, is that, um, and, and thank you for that. Is that related to Wim Hof? Is that what you're describing or is it something else? 
Yeah, so Wim Hof um, is an amazing, like, hero of mine, legend, tons of world records, and he combines mm -hmm. breathwork, a style of breathwork called TUMO, which is a super ventilation, so breathing fast, uh, followed by progressive holds, mm -hmm. and cold exposure, cold water exposure, ice bath, cold shower, and then mindset. And so his trio is combining those those three things. So yeah, what we're doing has some similarities for sure. Very cool. And, and I, I I love how you're explaining explaining the physiology of the body and kind of the chemistry involved with breath work. Um, the other benefit that I love is that we get a natural serotonin and dopamine, you know, rush as well. So it almost feels like a, a runner's high for um, you definitely feel expansive and elated. And um, I think that's really helpful for people that struggle with anxiety and depression too, at least um, from my experience. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. That is, uh, that's awesome. And um, oh, I had, uh, I know that we could probably talk for a whole other hour, but I know it's coming up pretty soon here at the end. Um, because we haven't even talked about psychedelics and I know you have a wealth of knowledge in that area too. Um, and, but I did want to ask you really quickly, um, you know, a lot of these breathwork practices, they have some spiritual basis to them. So, um, what role does, uh, spirituality play in your, in your practice and in your business? So spirituality for me is something I generally like to stay away from uh, in my business. Also, in terms of explanations, I find there's mm -hmm. a lot of dogma around it. And so my belief is just, hey, whatever somebody believes in, that's that's totally OK. And mm -hmm. we're trying to stick to science based descriptions of really what's happening in the body at the cellular level mm -hmm. and then practices that have been shown to help boost you know, mood, reduce fear, boost confidence, so stuff like traditional psychotherapy practices that you can take and apply to your own life, to your own emotions. So things like mm -hmm. subconscious beliefs, unmet needs, shadow work, really stuff that's rooted in science and mm -hmm. just stay away from the spiritual angle. And I'm, I would like to encourage people to kind of whatever they believe to, to go mm -hmm. for it. I'm, I'm just really, uh, trying to help people feel better, you know, more connected, yeah. more in love, more stronger connections with their community. So these things that mm -hmm. they can touch, I think there's such amazing, you know, apps on like meditation and spirituality and like just tons of traditions and books. I'm not really an expert in any of mm -hmm. that. And I think the people I've targeted are mostly like me. They, they were, you know, type A entrepreneurs, um people that are really hard on themselves lack self-love and like maybe aren't ready for spirituality they're just like hey i don't feel mm -hmm. good and so i'm just trying to yeah. help people that are overwhelmed take their first step in a way that's fun mm -hmm. and then when that opens up we usually will recommend you know retreats meditation retreats psychedelic medicine practitioners stuff like that mm -hmm. that they can like continue their journey but what i'm trying to avoid is something where someone's like oh well i don't really buy into spirituality or I don't have a belief or I have this no. belief. And so I just kind of stay, stay out of, out of that piece. Mm -hmm. No. And I love that because I think that they can definitely be, uh, go hand in hand and just the if physical expression does so much, um, for our physiology. Um, and, and eventually I think the two meet in their own way, but uh, again, like you said, what it really depends on the person and, and their belief system. But I'm always curious, especially with breath work, cause it can be, uh, such an expansive experience for so many people. Totally. I just want to keep from explaining to people, you know, this is how you should feel or, um, or even, and we do have some stuff on the website that goes more in that direction also, because as you said, mm -hmm. like once you come and you do breath work 10 times, you experience, so, you know, you're, especially through some of these hyperventilation or superventilation exercises where you're breathing out very quickly, mm -hmm. you're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood so much, the blood vessels constrict and the blood holds onto the oxygen. So you starve the brain, like the executive function of the brain that creates the ego of oxygen. And as a result, it shuts down and, and over mm -hmm. time it can create almost a near death experience. And so what happens is these traumas and emotions in the body start to come up and you feel mm -hmm. like a oneness, a connection as that 
you know, same part of your mind that exists in psychedelic medicines and in meditation, that part, that default mode network, when it shuts down, you have these mystical experiences and then it's, mm -hmm. you know, how do I explain what that is? <laughs> exactly. Um, and who knows, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's where the magic definitely the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's a beautiful uh, way that our, our bodies are miracles and are, they're beautifully designed, you know, so our unconscious mind and conscious mind, um, you know, being able to access that unconscious mind in a way that you're describing is we first got to shut shut down the the other part that's kind of like the monkey mind, so to speak, right? So, um, and, and then I think some people have people just different people have different ways they relate to things. So some people mm -hmm. are extremely connected spiritually, right? Like they really mm -hmm. feel feel super deep and some people very much um, resonate with the science. And then there's some people that resonate with indigenous practices so you know ceremony mm -hmm. and like calling in the elements and the sage and palo santo and different shamanic practices so i, I think mm -hmm. for us it's really just like find the one that resonates with you and mm -hmm. and go with that and i would never say like hey this way is right or that way is right it's very much just find what works for you mm -hmm. i love that yeah because it at the end of the day it is such an individual experience uh, uh, one of my mentors always says we're we're alone together, right, and on the journey, uh, which I love too, because it is you know we're in community, but ultimately it's all about getting to know ourselves better and finding these practices that can just help us feel better in a healthy way. Um, all right, well, awesome. Thank you for that. And um, I know we're we're coming up on the hour, so I just wanted to ask you one final question, which would be. You've given us so many gems today, which I, I want to thank you for. Uh, but what would be like your, your top three uh, things that you would um, uh, recommend to entrepreneurs that are that are kind of in a place um, like you were describing as far as overwhelm? You know, they've achieved a lot, but they're still not feeling fulfilled uh, in business and in life. I think time for play is one that is counterintuitive and super undervalued so it's very easy you know especially if you're an entrepreneur you generally tend to have drive to succeed which is why you ch you chose to do this and then that comes along with like a lot of personal stress and you can make these modalities stressful right so it's like oh, i didn't do my breath work or meditation today or missed my journaling or <laughs> i ate carbs or you know i didn't i didn't exercise and after like 10 15 years of of doing these things uh, it doesn't matter, you know, some days, you know, sometimes I'm really uptight with my diet, sometimes I'm not. And, and I've just learned to let it go mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. And so I think what does matter is having some time to yourself that's fun, that's like creative, that's that's just where you're not judging yourself. And whether that's for an hour walk, a meditation and playing an instrument, playing a video game, you know, whatever it is for you, that's going to allow you to be kind to yourself for an hour and be present. I think that's like mm -hmm. number one is just, okay, how do I actually have fun with what I'm mm -hmm. doing and where is there time in my schedule? And that was one I struggled with and I still struggle with because I always want to build and I'm like, oh, I have so much work. And if I don't give myself time for fun, no matter how much you care about your work and how much you're helping people, uh, it loses its its flavor. So that that's the first one is just like really have fun. Another one is don't be afraid of, of failure. And so, you know, from my business that failed for two years, I was worried like raising funding after funding and uh, dealing with difficult investors and like firing people and like just scared, like what if it fails? And finally it actually fails, <laughs> you know, within one month i had another opportunity that i was just as excited about and it's like wow you know okay all that worry and like it failed and so what so mm, i think I love usually that. what you're actually afraid of isn't such a big deal and that's something i learned from personal experience but also from tim ferris he has like a, a fear setting exercise where you actually write what it would feel like to fail and what you would do and like visualize mm -hmm. it and, and through that you realize um you know failure it's not that big a deal, especially when it's career related, because there's just always something else that you're going to be excited about that can fill the space. And so much learning to be had. Like that's how we learn as humans by failing forward, so to speak, right? Is you just got to get in, you just got to get in it and then kind of figure it out. So I love that message. And what was the last thing? Hmm. 
I think the final one is to, and I, I like to throw in my fiance at like every show just because I, I love her so much. But uh, as an entrepreneur, like, and from someone who's now has done okay financially, uh, it doesn't mean all that much. I think what really is important is um, your romantic connections, your family connections, your friend connections. And, and you know this when you get sick because the only thing that matters is there's someone there that, that loves you. And so it's always really interesting. I find when I'm sick because I'm like, okay, like building this company, you know, who cares going to the gym, who cares? But like, I feel bad. I'd love someone to comfort me and and be there for me. And so one thing that I've learned that we make, um, like absolute must is, uh, every morning we sleep naked together and have, you know, 15 minutes of cuddling and every night before bed, 15 minutes of cuddling is just a time to, connect and so if you can make that time to like you know touch through touch you can actually improve each other's heart rate variability you can sync heart rates with someone you love which is amazingly powerful Mm -hmm. um so you know you also increase oxytocin which is like the love hormone makes you happy through touch so touch is very underutilized so i think Mm -hmm. especially in this time of pandemic i think people are craving touch. yeah it's it's crazy so if you have the chance and you're you know you're dating somebody you have a partner a family like go in and like optimize the hugs and something i'm about to put on the breathwork site we just made was a a, which i'll send to you was a a couple's breathwork and it's got a nine minute eye gaze where you're actually touching and sinking your breath followed by uh a nine style. minutes that yeah. sounds intense robbie <laughs> yeah it's was well, three it's three minutes then three yeah. minutes with your eyes closed and it's okay. a bunch of different stuff happening where you're <laughs> sinking your breath with your partner then they're breathing in and you're breathing out and then you're you're feeling like what is the time i love this person the most what are some of the times they took care of me and so it's guiding mm-hmm. you you know so one we want to test it with people on their own with MDMA and like, see what happens. I think it would be incredible, but two, just as mm-hmm. a, you know, a specialty date once a month, you can jump in and do this like beautiful thing as a, as a couple. So focus on your relationship, long way of saying that <laughs> it's, like, it's important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's so um, it, it's beautiful. I love that you shared that. Thank you. I think those are all really practical tips. And, uh, and the last one is so needed because we are, we're all craving connection and just remembering it. I think sometimes people forget to give the people just immediately right in front of them that, that human touch that and, and revel in that connection. Cause that's really at the end of the day, um, the, what's going to make the quality of our lives better. So Awesome. Great. Beautiful. Amazing. Well, um, thank you so much for, for spending this hour with us and for sharing uh, so much wisdom, dropping some gems tonight um, or today um, for our listeners. And how can uh, people get a hold of you if they're interested in visiting you in Toronto at Inward or checking out your breathwork library? I'm also going to drop some links um, in in the comments uh, wherever this is posted. Uh, but just as a quick, can they follow you on social media or? Yeah, so uh, at Inward Breathwork is the Instagram handle and at go underscore Inward is the physical space Instagram handle. And then I'm on Twitter at Robbie Bent one. Um, that's the only social media I use. I try to try to minimize it. Um, but yeah, th- those uh, those three places and uh, a link to the site we'll put in the, the show notes with probably like a, a discount for your listeners. Wonderful. Thank you for that. It's amazing. And on Clubhouse, most definitely. And you said that that room that you host is on Monday nights? Or? Monday, Yeah, Monday nights at 9 p.m. And we're interviewing, you know, uh, researchers, drug developers, integration specialists, um, and other people, uh, clinicians, people building clinics, entrepreneurs in the space, people building like news sites. So anyone building something in the psychedelic medicine space, just a chance for them to talk about their why and also what they're struggling with and what they've learned as entrepreneurs in that space. So if you want to build a business in the space or interested in it, it's a, it's a great uh, weekly, weekly hang sesh. Amazing. Awesome. And I'll definitely be back for that.
Right. Well, I would just want to thank you guys for, for joining us. If you're listening all the way through to the end, I know we had a lot of gems that Robbie shared with us. Um, and again, we'll have all the details in the show notes for you. Uh, and if you are interested in joining the breathwork circle that I host every Wednesday night, it's, uh, it's at 7 PM Pacific standard time. You can sign up at breathe with risks, R I S S dot com. And it is uh, something that I do as a love offering every week. So come and check it out. And please uh, click on Robbie's links and check out his great library he has. All right. Bye for now.